Good morning, everyone, and welcome um, back to our study in Genesis. We're on uh, part 24 this time, and we're moving right along. We're up to chapter 25, so technically we're halfway through this 50-chapter book. So uh, let's begin with a prayer. <clears throat> Thank you, Abba, for this time that you give us to come together and to fellowship in your word and thank you for all the marvelous things that you've left there for us to discover. We ask that your spirit open our minds and our hearts to the things that we will see here this morning, that they might become a source of blessing and challenge for we ask these things in Jesus name. Amen. <clears throat> all right. Last session, <clears throat> We saw Abraham send a servant to get a wife for his son Isaac from his country or his home country where he came from and his kindred. He did not want a bride from among the godless Canaanites. And we saw how this process was a picture of the acts of the Holy Spirit in gathering a bride for the Lord Jesus Christ. Now we will skip ahead a few years and see the death of Abraham and the birth of two grandchildren by Isaac and Rebekah. But first, Abraham is going to take another wife. Genesis chapter 25 and verse 1. Abraham took another wife whose name was Keturah. She bore him Zimran, Jokshan, Midan, Midian, Ishbak, Shua, Jokshan fathered Sheba and Dedan, the sons of Dedan were Ashurim, Letushim, Lomim. The sons of Midian were Ephah, Ephher, Hanak, Abida, and Elda. All of these were the children of Keturah. I probably murdered some of those names, but you get the picture. <laughs> the list of Keturah's sons and peoples descended from them, as given here, is for two reasons. First, several of these people are mentioned in later biblical history. This list also demonstrates the fulfillment of the promise that Abraham would become the father of many nations. Abraham ultimately has a very large family. Evidently, the rejuvenation of his ability to procreate was not a one-shot event. <clears throat> Abraham was 138 when Sarah died, and he died at 100. Abraham was 138 when Sarah died. I'm sorry, I'm getting confused here. And he died at 175. Now, Abraham lived some 35 years after the marriage of Isaac, and all that is recorded concerning him during that time is found here in these very few verses. <clears throat> Sometime after Sarah's death, Abraham married Keturah. She was his concubine, according to, according to 1 Chronicles 132. That union resulted in the birth of six more sons, and they fathered some nine more grandchildren. There were likely more children, and here only the males are named, while some of their descendants will be seen again in Scripture and play roles in the story. The focus will be on the line to Christ through Isaac and Jacob. <clears throat> One of them that does show up later is Midian, and he will play a role in Scripture. He is the father of the Midianites, and we will find Moses going to the land of Midian to take a wife there for himself. But the Lord has said it is through Isaac that Abraham's seed is called, not Ishmael or through any of the others. <clears throat> Verse 5. <clears throat> Excuse me. Abraham gave all that he had to Isaac, but to the sons of his concubines, Abraham gave gifts. And while he was still living, he sent them away from his son Isaac eastward to the east country. These are the days of the years of Abraham's life, 175 years. Abraham breathed his last and died in a good old age, an old man and full of years, and was gathered to his people. Isaac and Ishmael, his sons, buried him in the cave of Machpelah, 
in the field of Ephraim, the son of Zohar, the Hittite, east of Mamre, the field that Abraham purchased from the Hittites. There Abraham was buried with his wife, Sarah, and after the death of Abraham, God blessed Isaac, his son, and Isaac settled at Beer Lahai Roy. <clears throat> Now, Isaac was Abraham's heir, and he inherited all of his father's wealth. But before he died, however, Abraham bestowed generous gifts upon the sons of his concubines. The plural certainty certainly includes Keturah and Hagar and possibly other unnamed concubines not mentioned in Scripture. The sons of Abraham occupied the desert to the east of Canaan. Many were leaders of nomadic tribes. Abraham loved all these boys, but they and their descendants may have posed a threat to Isaac. And Abraham sent them away, as he had done with Ishmael, thus preserving Isaac's primacy and his right as Abraham's heir. <clears throat> Abraham breathed his laugh and died at a good old age, an old man and full of years. That's from verse 8. He was 175 at the time. That's a pretty good old age in my book. Ishmael came back from the funeral, came back for the funeral of his father, and he and Isaac buried Abraham alongside his wife Sarah in the cave purchased from Ephron for that purpose. The term gathered to his people means not just that Abraham's body rested with his relatives in the family grave, but that his soul was reunited with there's in the afterlife. After the death of Abraham, God blessed Isaac, who was still residing near Beer Lahai Roy at that time. Isaac was 75 when his father died and 123 when his brother Ishmael died. Some 48 years of Isaac's life are passed over in silence in Genesis 25. After the funeral, Isaac and Rebekah returned to Beer Lahai Roy. <clears throat> this was the place where God was known to respond. God had heard Hagar there and had delivered her. And Isaac mediate, meditated there while waiting for his future wife. Thus, Isaac lived at a special place, a place where God had answered prayer. Verse 12. These are the generations of Ishmael, Abraham's son, whom Hagar, the Egyptian, Sarah's servant, bore to Abraham. These are the names of the sons of Ishmael, named in the order of their birth. Nebaioth, the firstborn of Ishmael, Kedar, Adbil, Adbil Mibsam, Mishma, Duma, Masa, Hadad, Tima, Jitar, Nepish, and Kedema, these are the sons of Ishmael, and these are their names, by their villages and by their encampments, twelve princes according to their tribe. So these are the years of the life of Ishmael, 137 years. He breathed his laugh and died and was gathered to his people. They settled from Havilah to Shur which is opposite Egypt in the direction of Assyria. He settled over against all of his kinsmen. While on the subject of genealogy, we have that of Ishmael listed here. And Ishmael was also a son of Abraham. So God told what became of him and his line before returning to the chosen line. The secession of Isaac. Ishmael had 12 sons, as God had predicted, and died at the age of 137. Like his father, Ishmael was gathered to his people. The narrator mentioned three points in which the prophecies regarding Ishmael's found fulfillment. And these three points are there were 12 tribal rulers came from Ishmael, just as promised. His descendants lived in the desert area from Havilah, which is the location is actually unknown, to Shur near the border of Egypt. And the Ishmaelites lived in hostility towards their brethren. 
Now we'll see the birth of Esau and Jacob. In the first chapter of Matthew, it begins, Abraham was the father of Isaac, and Isaac the father of Jacob, and Jacob the father of Judah and his brothers. Each of these men had other sons, as we've seen, but the genealogies of these others are not followed. The line we're going to follow is that line that leads directly to the seed of the woman, Jesus Christ. Just as the account of Terah is largely concerned with Terah's son, Abraham, the account of Isaac <laughs> tells the story of Isaac's son, Jacob, and Esau. It begins with two boys fighting each other in the womb and continues with Jacob cheating Esau out of his birthright and his blessing. Genesis 25, 19. These are the generations of Isaac, Abraham's son. Abraham fathered Isaac, and Isaac was 40 years old when he took Rebekah, the daughter of Bethuel, and our man, the Aramean and Pat of Pateram, and the sister of Laban, the Aramean, to be his wife. And Isaac prayed to the Lord for his wife because she was barren. And the Lord gathered his prayer, granted his prayer, and Rebekah, his wife, conceived. Isaac was 40 when he married and 60 when his twin sons were born. For 20 years, his faith, like that of his father before him, was tested by the barrenness of his wife. But Isaac knew that covenant promise demanded that he and Rebekah have children. Therefore, he went on his knees on behalf of his barren wife. And God answered that prayer, and Rebekah became pregnant. When Abraham's wife Sarah was barren, instead of going to the Lord in prayer for a divine solution, they devised a human solution in that Abraham would sire a son through Sarah's handmaiden, Hagar. In stark contrast to the schemes of his father and mother, Isaac prayed, and God responded. This shows that births are sometimes supernatural provisions. Later, Rachel, Jacob's wife, was also temporarily barren. Genesis 25, 22. The children struggled together within her, and she said, If it is thus, why is this happening to me? So she went to inquire of the Lord, and the Lord said to her, Two nations are in your womb, and two peoples from within you shall be divided. The one shall be stronger than the other, and the older shall serve the younger. Rebecca experienced a difficult pregnancy. The twins struggled together within her. <clears throat> Evidently, the struggles going on between the two boys in her womb were intense, even violent, for Rebecca complained to, to complain so. She regarded her pain as an ominous sign and went to inquire of the Lord, possibly at the home of some prophet. Her petition was simply, why is this happening to me? Others translated more desperately as a cry of despair. Wherefore do I live? It should be noted that the translation struggled or jostled in some translations is a little weak. Rebecca's plea seems to confirm that. The Hebrew speaks of something much more violent than the children struggled within her. This was a foreshadowing of future difficulties between the brothers. Through the prophetic intermediary, the Lord gave Rebecca a fourfold response. <clears throat> Rebecca would bear twins who would be ancestors of two great nations. The second, two separate and distinct peoples would emerge from these twins. The third, one of these people would exceed the other in strength. And the fourth, the oldest son would serve the younger. The Hebrew here is ambiguous and could just as well be rendered the small shall serve the great. <clears throat> this might account for the differences in the way Rebekah and Isaac regarded the two boys. Indeed, the Is Israelites, Jacob's descendants, and the Edomites, Esau's descendants, fought continuously. 
the older shall serve the younger, tells us that contrary to cultural tradition, God determined that the younger of the twins would receive the birthrights, normally the property of the elder. God's election of Jacob, the younger, over Esau, the older, was against the natural order. <clears throat> the struggle between these two boys, which began before birth, represents the struggle that still goes on today. The struggle between light and darkness. The struggle between good and evil. Between the spirit and the flesh. Every one of us knows about this struggle. We deal with it every day ourselves. Paul speaks of his own experiences with this, this struggle in Romans chapter 7, but verse 15 pretty much sums up what we all experience. Romans seven fifteen. For I do not understand my own actions, for I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. Like Rebecca, and Paul experienced the forces of light and dark struggle within our own souls. <clears throat> as much as we might hate our sinfulness, we find ourselves drifting back into the same sinful behavior that we hate instead of doing what we want. In Genesis 25, 24, we have, <clears throat> when our days to give birth were completed, behold, there were twins in her womb. The first came out red, all his body like a hairy cloak, as they were caught, they called his name Esau. Afterward, his brother came out with his hand holding Esau's heel. So his name was called Jacob. Isaac was 60 years old when she bore them. When the boys grew up, Esau was a skillful hunter, a man of the field, while Jacob was a quiet man dwelling in tents. Esau, Isaac loved Esau because he ate of his game, but Rebekah loved Jacob. <clears throat> Isaac and Rebekah <clears throat> had been married about 20 years when she had the twins. The parents observed the strange situation and commemorated the event by giving them appropriate names. The first of the twins was red and hairy, like an animal, so they named him Esau, which means hairy. The mention of red anticipated the future rugged nature of Esau, Jacob's laying hold of Esau's heel as though to catch him and trip him gave him the name Jacob, the heel gripper transplanter, schemer, or deceiver is what the word means. <clears throat> Fascinating word plays were used to describe the first twin. The name Esau was a loose, has a loose connection to the word Seir, and the early name for Edom in the southeast of the Dead Sea, where Esau later lived. The Hebrew word read Admonai, is related to the word Edom, and, the, and Harry, Sayar, is similar to Seir. These words were carefully chosen to portray in the child the nature of Edom, a later arch rival of Israel. <clears throat> the second twin was born grasping Esau's heel. Given the oracle the parents had received, it seemed appropriate to give this child a name that would preserve the memory of this event. The name Jacob, a Jacob, means may he, God, protect. And was selected because of its connection in sound and sense to the noun of heel, akib. The word akab which means to watch from behind. Also, the verb akad means to watch from behind. As with Esau, Jacob's name would take on a different sense later in life as his deceptive nature became more evident. His name also meant one who grabs the heel or one who trips up. So the twins' births had great significance for later events in their lives. The two boys are as different as twins can be. They struggled in the womb and struggled in life with different viewpoints and philosophies of life. 
Esau was a skillful hunter and man of the field, while Jacob was a quiet man. Quiet is the Hebrew word tom, and it means integrity, completeness, fullness, or even innocence or simplicity. J. Vernon McGee sees him as mama's boy, and that may be largely driven by the next verse. Esau loved, uh, Isaac loved Esau because he ate of his game, but Rebecca loved Jacob. Jacob became a cool, calculating stay-at-home, whereas Esau became an impetuous, active countryman. The father favored the more active, outdoorsy Esau. He especially liked the eat of the wild game he brought home. Rebecca, however, preferred the more, preferred the more pensive and cunning Jacob. Esau loved the outdoors, especially hunting, and eating the game he brought home. He was more physical and athletic than his brother and probably had a physique, physique that matched his heart's desire. That lifestyle is what he lived for. His brother Jacob, however, was very different. Above, we describe him in somewhat negative tones, and he was indeed a cunning man, but down underneath that negative personality, he had a desire for things spiritual. It took God a while to clean him up and get down to where that spiritual desire was. But before we are finished with Jacob, and he will be with us through the end of this study of Genesis, we will see that he was God's man all along, although he didn't demonstrate it until the end. <clears throat> the incident we're about to look at reveals the nature of these two men, Esau and Jacob. The attitudes displayed in this little tableau tells of their personalities and values. Genesis 25, 29. Once, while Jacob was cooking stew, Esau came in from the field, and he was exhausted. And Esau said to Jacob, let me eat some of that red stew, for I am exhausted. Therefore, his name was called Edom. Jacob said, Sell me your birthright now. Esau said, I'm about to die. Of what use is the birthright to me? Jacob says, swear to me now. So he swore to him and sold his birthright to Jacob. And Jacob gave Esau bread and lentil stew, and he ate and drank and rose and went his way. Thus Esau despised his birthright. We have here a bargain made, made between Jacob and Esau about the birthright that was Esau's by birth, but Jacob's by promise. The birthright and double portion of the inheritance goes to the firstborn. It was the spiritual privilege, including the excellency of dignity and the excellency of power. Esau was technically the firstborn and due the birthrights of that position. However, Jacob was designated by God to receive the birthrights of the firstborn. And the Lord said to her, two nations are in your womb and two people from within you shall be divided. The one shall be stronger than the other. The older shall serve the younger. <clears throat> what does this birthright mean? It means that the one who had it was the head of the house. Furthermore, it meant that he was also the priest of the house. And in this particular family, it meant the one who had it would be in the line that leads to Christ. Do you think J Esau valued that? Jacob knew he attached no importance to it whatsoever and had no desire to be the family priest. After all, it might interfere with his hunting. Been there and experienced that myself. God took care of that barrier to service and made hunting a less than thrilling experience for me. Back to our story. <clears throat> Jacob, evidently an accomplished chef, had prepared a pot, prepared a pot of red stew made from lentil beans. Red's the Hebrew word adom, which is Stated above relates to Edom, 
the eventual home of the Edomites, the descendants of Esau. His connection with the Red Stew, and it's pottage in some translations, gave him the nickname Edom. Therefore, his name was called Edom. <clears throat> Jacob is looking for a red stew, is cooking up a red stew, and in walks Esau from one of his hunting trips. And he immediately takes notice of the red stew on the stove. Either he had not been successful in taking any game that day, or he was simply too lazy to take the time to prepare a meal for himself. And I believe it's the latter. Plus the red stew smelled good. He claimed he was very hungry, exhausted, and about to die. Esau was not about to die from any hunger. No one in wealthy Abraham's house would die from hunger. Esau was not as desperate as he sounds here. I believe his desperate tone displays an arrogant urgency driven by his sense of privilege. He wanted to eat, and he wanted to eat now. And the red stew in the pot appealed to the red man. Jacob sees his chance and takes advantage, takes advantage of his brother's spiritual weakness. Jacob said, tell me your birthright now. Considering the spiritual state of Esau, we can safely assume, as had Jacob, that Esau has zero interest in his birthright. He had no desire to be the family priest or devote his days to spiritual matters. So the drama queen replied, I'm about to die of what use is the birthright to me. <laughs> Jacob must have thought then, gotcha. He then said something on the order of, tell you what I'm going to do. If you give me your birthright, I'll give you a bowl of this delicious red stew. But you have to swear on it. Deal? Esau had no interest in anything spiritual. His birthright meant nothing to him. Verses 33 and 34 conclude our little story with, so he swore to him and sold his birthright to Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau bread and lentil stew, and he ate and drank and rose and went his way. He ate, wiped his mouth, probably belched loudly, and walked out. He traded everything of any real value for a bowl of stew, some bread, and some wine. Thus Esau despised his birthright. Esau, Esau despised his spiritual privileges as the firstborn and chose the flesh, not the spirit. He viewed his birthright with contempt, and as worthless to him. He would rather feed his body than enjoy the promises of God. We never read of Esau having a tent or an altar. And Genesis 26, 30 through 35, and in Hebrews 12, 16, indicate that he loved worldly women. Genesis 26, 34, when Esau was 40 years old, he took Judah, the daughter of Beer, Beeri, the Hittite, to be his wife, and Basemoth, the daughter of Elon, the Hittite, and they made life bitter for Isaac and Rebekah. In Hebrew 12, 16, it says that no one is sexually immoral or unholy like Esau, who sold his birthright for a single meal. Esau may have been a success in the world, but he was a failure with God. Esau, the red man, was overcome by his physical appetite for red stew, and he sold his birthright. And Jacob, the heel grabber, cunningly overtook his brother and gained the birthright. He took advantage of his brother's weak character and his hunger unto death plea for food. Though Jacob was not righteous, he was not deceptive, at least in this instance. He was open and obvious, but he was unscrupulous. However, he must be given credit for knowing what was of value and going after it. Esau, however, was totally godless. The elder shall serve the younger. The birthright is coming to Jacob. 
God had promised it to his mother, but it would be granted on God's timing. Jacob acquired it in an unscrupulous manner. He should have waited until God gave it to him. It's always better to wait on God's timing. Jacob probably thinks to himself, thinks of himself as clever enough to get whatever he has coming to him. But he will himself be schooled by his uncle Laban at the College of Hard Knocks, as we will see later in our story. God told Rebekah that two nations were to be born and that contrary to custom, the elder would serve the younger. This is clear evidence of God's sovereign election. Romans 9.10 tells us, and not only so, but also when Rebekah had conceived children by one man, our forefather Isaac, though they were not yet born and had done nothing either good or bad in order that God's purpose of election might continue, not because of works, but because of him who calls. She, she was told the elder will serve the younger, as it is written, Jacob, I love but Esau I hated. What shall we say then? Is there injustice on God's part? By no means. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. So then it depends not on human will or exertion, but on God who has mercy. His choice was not based on the deeds of the boys. They were unborn and had neither done neither good nor evil. For as character is concerned, Esau was the more acceptable of the two. At least he was honest about his desires. Yet Jacob was the one chosen by God. Ephesians 2.8 says, For by grace we have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It's the gift of God, not a result of work, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. And that concludes our session this time, which is a little shorter than normal, but I didn't want to get started in the next chapter and not be able to finish it. So, um, anyone have any thoughts or comments they'd like to throw out here? Lane, you used the word primacy early in your talk, mm -hmm. and you referred to uh, the primacy of, uh, was it Isaac? Yeah. But was it? But wasn't Ishmael born before Isaac? Yes, but Ishmael was not born of the promise. The promise was made that it would the son would come from um, Sarah. <laughs> mm -hmm. so, uh, so the it's the primacy of the promise. Yeah, and. This application, yes. <clears throat> Thank you. You always come up with a good question, Collins. <laughs> you keep me on my toes. Sometimes I trip and fall. But the scripture calls them twins, but they certainly didn't look anything alike. <laughs> no, they didn't. They were not identical twins. <clears throat> and I assume they have had other people hairy that way that have been born. It's highly unusual. Yeah, it is. And I, I really don't know what to make of that description, exactly how hairy was he. Um, I've known some people with a lot of body hair, uh, but this almost sounds like it's to an offensive level. <laughs> yeah. Mm -mm -mm. All right. 
Well, I guess that concludes our session for today. And um, we'll be back same time, same station next week. Well, let's close with prayer. Thank you again, Abba, for the time that you've given us in your word and for this fellowship that we have. Uh, we ask that uh, as we go through this week, that your spirit might bring these things to mind, that we might meditate on them, and uh, that uh, they might become a source of blessing and challenge in our lives. And then in the process of drawing closer to you through your word, that we might become more of a witness in Satan's world for you. For we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.